Hello and welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to talk about my favorite books of 2023. So once again, welcome or welcome back. I am so glad you decided to click on this video today. So if I don't quite sound my best, it's because I don't quite feel my best, but this is just such a fun video to make. So I didn't wanna sit on it any longer. I just wanted to go ahead and film it. So forgive me if my voice sounds a little weird. However, I did get a new mic, well a new mic. I did get a mic for Christmas, which I am now using. So hopefully the sound is better than it is in previous videos. You'll have to let me know what you think in the comments, see if you can even notice a difference. So like I said, I'm just gonna talk about all my favorite books from 2023. Now, I will say this was a really hard list to make. I had a really great year for reading. I had so many books that could have like been new favorites and I actually, had about twice as many as I wanted to do for this list, like on a, sh a short list of sorts. So I do wanna quickly just go through those so you know other books that really like had my heart too. So those are Second Chances in Newport Stephen by TJ Alexander, The River We Remember by William Kent Kruger, Shark Heart by Emily Habick, Dead Eleven by Jimmy Giuliano, Symphony of Secrets by Brendan Slocum, Miracle Creek by Angie Kim, Only the Beautiful by Susan Meissner, and Drowning by TJ Newman. Those were all books that could easily have been on this list, but these other 10 just squeaked them out just a little bit. So with that, let's get started on my top 10 books of 2023. Now, if you've been watching my channel, some of these you will have definitely heard me speak about before, but if that doesn't tell you, you should be reading them. I don't know what will. So first on this list is Adelaide by Genevieve Wheeler. This has been a favorite of mine since the beginning of the year. I actually just reread it last week and it's still one of my favorite books of this year. So it definitely made this list. This is about an American expat who lives in London and at the opening of the book, Adelaide Williams goes to the hospital to check herself in because she is having suicidal thoughts and she's like, I need help. From there, we flash back to her relationship with a man named Vori Hughes who she met on an app and all of their their troubles and where, where it all began and, and throughout their relationship to get her to this point. This is a really raw and honest look at relationships in like the modern world. I have no experience dating on apps because I was already married when that kind of like became commonplace. So I, I don't really have firsthand experience, but from friends I've seen and everything, like it's, it's tough out there. <laughs> it's real tough, especially with like all of the apps and you don't know who's still on another app and this and that. And so it was just, it was a like really nuanced look at relationships. I felt completely taken into the story. And like, I was one of Adelaide's friends. She has an amazing friend group. So I loved reading about them. And this is a book that I just found to be so relatable. Like I haven't been in a relationship that wasn't with my husband in like 13 years. So it's been a really long time for me to kind of relate to these, but even those feelings can still come back of just like being heartbroken, thinking your life is over because a relationship ends. And like, it was just so relatable. And I feel like anyone who has ever experienced heartbreak will love this. Another one you have certainly heard me talk about before is We Spread by Ian Reed. This is just Another one I read back in January and I haven't shut up about since. So this is about a woman named Penny and her longtime partner passes away. And before that happened, he had made arrangements for her to move into a home for the elderly when she gets to a certain age. And then she has a big fall and her landlord who kind of keeps an eye on her makes the executive decision that like it's time you can't live by yourself anymore. So she moves into this home for elderly care but but she's still very mobile and she does not want to go very very strongly does not want to go she meets a couple other residents and like it's a really small place she kind of starts to find that she's like losing gaps of time or people are telling her things happened that she doesn't remember happening or things that didn't happen she's like making up she kind of gets to this point where she's like trying to figure out if she's losing her mind and like her memory or if they're gaslighting her. And it's just 
wild. This really, really got to me. It is so short and sweet, but like the punch that it packs is mind blowing. It really kind of <laughs> gave me a new fear of like aging and kind of like losing my sense of reality when I get old, so that's fun. Also the kind of idea of like being forgotten and not like leaving a legacy in any way. It's not something I think I really fear in real life, but like reading this book definitely kind of put that in my brain. While this one definitely still has a lot of plot, it is a lot of vibes. Very atmospheric, very like a slow creeping sort of horror as opposed to like jump scares and what what. It's like very psychological. And the thing that really stuck out to me and made this a favorite is how it kind of poses the question if life is really worth living and like continuing to go on and on and on if everyone you love and everything you love is no longer with you. So I just found this really thought provoking, really, really good. And I really should reread it. All right, the third book is the last one that I have talked about a million times. So after this, they will become newer books you haven't heard me speak of before. But this one is Nothing to See Here by Kevin Wilson. This, like I said, I've talked about so much. I feel silly repeating it, but in case this is your first time on my channel, welcome. And let me tell you about this book. So this is about a woman named Lillian who is kind of in a rough spot in life. She's just down on her luck. Things are not going her way. And she gets a phone call from her old roommate from boarding school named Madison, who wants her to come be a live-in nanny for her two stepchildren. The two stepchildren have some kind of condition that makes them burst into flames, kind of like their bodies catch on fire when they get angry or annoyed or agitated. Like, what is that about? Their mother has just passed away, so they are coming to live with their father, Madison's husband, who is like a rising politician. He really doesn't want anything to do with these kids because they're weird freaks, and, you know, he's trying to rise the ranks of the government, and he doesn't want them to, like, have anything to do with that. He's also just not a very nice guy. Over the course of this one summer, Lillian kind of has to get through to them and they kind of have to like soften her edges and it's just like a really sweet, wholesome type of story. Other than it's a completely original plot, I love this book because it's just like just the right amount of quirky. It's also really short, which I love, but it does tell like a complete story. I really felt like this one was perfect at the length it is. I really loved how the twins and Lillian kind of helped each other grow. And it wasn't like a one-sided relationship where Lillian was trying to get them to come out of their shells and open up because, you know, they've been mistreated a little bit. But they they kind of take a liking to her and make her kind of soften up because she's had a tough life too. And I just, I really loved that. It was so sweet. It gave me vibes of the house in the Cerulean Sea, just in that it's like some lovable weirdos like going through life together. All right, the next is The Gay Best Friend by Nicholas DiDemizio. This I read mm, maybe over the summer. Oh, I just fell in love. I was just, mm, this one is so, so funny. So this is about a man named Dom and his best friend Patrick. They have been best friends since childhood. Patrick got to high school and kind of became like a football jock, like popular guy. And Dom was still kind of figuring out who he was when he came out. Um, it was a little, they had like a little bit of weirdness, but like Patrick definitely didn't like have a problem with it. It was just, they've been best friends through a lot. And Patrick is engaged to a woman named Kate who has also become one of Dom's best friends. Now, Dom is invited to both the bachelor and the bachelorette party, which puts him in a really weird position because Kate tells him, hey, like, don't let anything crazy happen. You have to let me know if it does. And he's like, I don't know, like, I kind of, my loyalties to him, but like, also, I love you. And it's very, like, awkward situation. While at the bachelor party, there are definitely things that happen that Kate would not love. Additionally, Patrick's fraternity brother, who is like a uh, golf PGA superstar named Bucky Graham, shows up. And Dom might have more in common with him than he thought. In the past, they've kind of butted heads a little bit. But after the bachelor party, Dom finds himself in a really awkward position and it kind of goes from there. Drama ensues. This book is laugh out loud hilarious. And I do not say that lightly. I 
cackled. Especially if you are a millennial, I think a lot of the humor is like so spot on for this generation. And I actually read this and then reached out to the author to be like, how old are you? Are you my exact same age? Because there were so many little mentions of like specific events in like the early 2000s or like just whatever. And yeah, we're the exact same age and he is a delightful if you read this and want to chat with him. I'm sure he's open to it. Yeah, this was just so funny. Dom had so much character growth. He was so well developed and I loved the relationship between him and Patrick, him and Kate, him and Bucky. Like they all just had such like unique relationships, but they were all super strong, you could tell, and it was just beautiful. Something I really loved too is how it really showed that you are still growing and learning about who you are as a person when you're well into your 30s, because I feel like that all the time. I feel like I'm still kind of learning who Laura is, and it's it was nice to see that reflected in a book. The fifth book is Such Sharp Teeth by Rachel Harrison. I actually did a, a little bit of a reading vlog on this one back in September. I can definitely link it up above. This one was perfect for reading in September. This is about a woman named Rory who returns to her hometown to help take care of her pregnant sister, her twin, who has like been kind of left by her boyfriend. So one night she goes out to a bar and runs into kind of like the one that got away. I guess they never were in a relationship because like timing just never happened, but like there was definitely chemistry there. And on her way home, she hits a large animal in the woods, kind of. She, it's a very small town and she has to take some back roads to get home. So she hits this animal, she gets out to go like see what she hit, like what's going on, and she gets attacked by like a huge animal. And then she starts to find some weird things go on. She, she ends up in the hospital, but she's okay. But she does start to realize like different things going on. She's very affected by the moons. She has an aversion to silver. She wants to eat like raw meat. You get where this is going. And it's just so great. This is like the perfect dark comedy. And back to what I said before, this is like a perfect spooky season read for someone who does not like traditional horror or is looking for something a little more lighthearted. There's like the sweetest romance and it's one of those like long time coming sort of romances. It's like second chance romance but like also not really and I love sister relationships and there's so much about these two sisters and their banter is just perfection. Next is Looking for Jane by Heather Marshall. This follows three different timelines. So the first is in 1971 and follows a woman named Evelyn who is engaged and her fiance ends up passing away, but she's pregnant and she gets sent to a home for unwed mothers and she is forced to give her baby up for adoption despite that she doesn't want to. And she is inspired to kind of start this network or join this network, I should say, of Janes who will provide abortions to women who can't get them essentially to keep them from getting back alley abortions, which kills a lot of people. The next storyline is in 1980, which follows Nancy, who is a woman that gets pregnant and has an illegal abortion. And she ends up joining the network as well. And then in 2017, a woman named Angela, who finds this letter in her antique shop that she works at. And it's from 10 years prior, written by an adoptive mother who had never told her child that she was adopted. And Angela becomes like determined to find the intended recipient and of course, all these storylines, we go back and forth in time and all these storylines intersect at some point during the story. So this was just so wonderful. It was so powerful. And so this book is set in Toronto. So there is a lot of the timelines that I was like, wait, what? Because different things happened in different times, like abortion didn't become legal in Canada until 1988. And in the US, it was earlier, of course. <laughs> Now we're in a different situation, but it was just like really heart-wrenching what these poor women were dealing with in an already horrible situation to have to deal with an unplanned pregnancy. This book really showed how important abortion access is to women and their lives, and that like no governing body or religious group has a right to decide what happens to an individual's body. I was completely gripped from beginning to end, and it was like, I just couldn't 
put it down. This definitely left me feeling angry and really fired up. And it is a really good reminder of what is at stake for women every single day and made me kind of rethink my activism in this regard and like doing more, like sending $10 a month to Planned Parenthood. We could do more than that. So this was really powerful and honestly like just a really inspiring book especially in this ugly time we are having for women in America. My next favorite book was Meet the Benedettos by Katie Catugno. I read this recently, so you might have heard me talk about it in a couple videos ago, but this is like a Pride and Prejudice retelling that kind of meets the Kardashians. Sounds crazy, but it was phenomenal. So it follows this reality TV family who is kind of like past their heyday, they're kind of on the outs and they're like losing a lot of money and having to scale back their expenses from being like this superstar family that's no longer generating such an income and living within their means. So next door, a man moves in who is like the next big thing of like Marvel Cinematic Universe character. I mean, obviously they call it something else, but like a Marvel type superhero. And he brings with him his friend Will, Will Darcy, who is kind of like this sullen like stage actor and like stuff's just not really working out for him in New York so he came to live with his friend in LA. So Lily, the second oldest Benedetto daughter, she kind of keeps running into Will. They have this not great relationship. They keep fussing at each other. They're just not getting along and her sister ends up starting to sort of see the friend. So they end up having to spend time together. They just also randomly keep running into each other and you you know if you know Pride and Prejudice you know how it all ends but like also it's a romance so you probably know how it ends anyways but this is just such a fun book this hilarious dysfunctional family the humor was so smart one-liners banter off the charts it was just so great and like the perfect like vacation read I would love for this to be a series I would love to read about the other Benedetto daughters so if anyone is listening that has the power to make that happen please do. The eighth book on this list is Holly by Stephen King. This is no surprise to anyone. I am a huge Stephen King fan and I am really a huge Holly Gibney fan. So we are back with this character. She made her first appearance in the Mr. Mercedes trilogy and I just think that's one of Stephen King's most underrated books, book series, I guess. I love all of them. From there she was featured heavily in The Outsider and she had the entire title story in If It Bleeds, which is a short story collection. And now she has her own full-length novel. So that was awesome. So we go back to Finders Keepers Detective Agency that she owns. And, you know, I don't want to get too much into it, but this is a book that comes right out and tells you who the villain is and what's going to happen. We have cannibalism. We have academia. We have the world in the midst of the COVID pandemic. And it was just really intriguing. I couldn't put it down. Holly continues to be one of my favorite characters of all time. She is such a complex character, but she does become more defined every story that I read about her. There is a lot of political commentary, but I mean, if you read Stephen King, you would already know where he stands and that that's gonna come into the book, especially for a book that has such a focus on the pandemic. Super, super graphic, but it did what it was trying to do. It it got you feeling the way you were supposed to be. Honestly, Stephen King is just such a masterful writer. I feel like I don't need to explain anymore. The next book on this list is The Spectacular by Fiona Davis. This is one I read back in the springtime and just absolutely loved. This is set in 1956. A woman named Marion becomes a Radio City Rockette against her family and her boyfriend's wishes. They do not approve. She's having a blast, but it is like a super grueling schedule. She's at rehearsals. She does four shows a day. It's exhausting. It's a lot. So one night, a bomb goes off in the theater during a performance, and she actually sees the man who did it as he leaves the theater. There's also a personal tie to one of the victims in the theater at the time and so she gets involved in the investigation and it really shows you like a lot about profiling, criminal profiling that detectives do. This had such great vibes, Christmassy dancing, I loved it. I used to dance, it was my major in college all through my childhood and so like I just, I love that aspect of this book. I also really loved the mystery aspect. 
This was based on true events, the Mad Bomber in New York, which I had no idea was a thing. So that was super interesting to me. I really enjoyed kind of like taking this a step further and researching that once I finished this book. Loved the strong friendships between the dancers. That was so nice to read about. Like not a lot of cattiness, not a lot of anything, just like really, really nice friendships. And if you watch Criminal Minds, if you enjoy that show, I feel like you will like this because it is very heavy on the like profiling, how that all works, and I found it fascinating. And last but certainly not least on this list is Lucky Girl by Irene Muchemi Duritu. So this is set in the 1990s and a woman named Soila, well, a girl named Soila lives a very sheltered but privileged life in Nairobi with her mother and her aunts, and she ends up being sexually assaulted by a very trusted family friend, and she's like, hell no, I'm out of here. She goes to New York City for college, even though her mother is really against it, her family is not thrilled, and it's a huge culture shock to her. She is so confused about a lot that's going on, she's just appalled at like the racism that she's not experienced in Kenya as a wealthy woman. She, the entitlement of rich and white people in the US. In addition to being from a completely different culture, she was very, very sheltered. So she comes to New York City and is learning so much about the world and about the culture of the United States. She ends up meeting a man who she falls in love with. He's like a free-spirited artist, which definitely is difficult culture-wise. And so it kind of just follows her coming to terms with who she is growing up and reconciling her Kenyan culture with her current life in New York City. This is a really great example of a book being super character focused, but with enough plot to really keep keep the story moving. It was so nice and interesting to watch her go from this like scared kid who is just terrified of disappointing her family to like a woman in the world who like knows what she wants and goes after it. And I also really liked learning a lot about the Kenyan culture because I, I don't feel like that's something that I have gotten much experience reading about and I thought it was really, really fascinating to learn about. Previously, most of my knowledge of Kenya has come from 90 Day Fiance, so this was very good to supplement what I already knew. So those are my top 10 books of 2023. I would highly recommend checking them out in addition to the other books that I mentioned at the beginning of this video. If you want to see the books that I liked the least in 2023, check out my last video posted. I will link it up above and down below. Happy New Year! I am hoping to get one more video posted before the new year, but if not, Thank you so much for another wonderful year spent with me on YouTube. I still can't believe I'm doing this and it's just, it's such a blast. I hope to just keep improving, keep doing this better in 2024 and there's a lot of exciting stuff happening and I can't wait to share it all with you. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed, I would love it if you would and I will see you in the next one. Bye!